Hello, I'm Chris Parker from the Royal Marsden Hospital in London. I'm here at GU ASCO in San Francisco with my good friend and colleague from Berlin, uh, Kurt Miller. So, Kurt, we've um, seen some data presented here uh, predicting the outcome of treatment with abiraterone. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, that's what, what uh, people always try to do to put patients into prognostic groups, kind of. And then see uh, if they uh, what what the outcome is in terms of progression-free or oral survival. Um, the, the problem with all these prognostic models, be it nomograms or be it like here that you use a couple of um, blood markers uh, to do that, is always does it really influence your decision making? Um, and in the case of abiraterone, which now has kind of a monopole in the in first line treatment of uh, MCRPC, I would doubt that this really influences people's decision making. Because you give abiraterone to all your patients. You give, I mean, yeah, you give it uh, probably to all the patients uh, um, because the question always is even if that would be a patient in the poor prognosis group, uh, the question comes up, is there any other drug where the patient does better on than abiraterone, and we don't know. And of course, the alternative, currently at least, would be to give him, let's say, chemotherapy with docetaxel, and many patients are reluctant to do that. So even if you have only a small advantage using abiraterone in that setting, you would, would you would you would use it anyway. Yeah. What well, we need are predictive Predict markers, correct. and we haven't got any. No, there is. There have been some attempts to to create some predictive markers. But so far, actually, as you say, we haven't gotten any. OK, so let's move on then. There's um, been some data presented about the activity of enzalutamide when used after abiraterone. And this is not the first small study um, looking at the effect of enzalutamide post abiraterone. When you look back at the affirmed data, of course, these have been patients that have never had abiraterone. It's been just post-dose ataxel. But this is not today's reality anymore because today probably 60, 70, 80 percent of patients have gotten abiraterone and then dose ataxel and probably then enzalutamide. And so <coughs> what happens actually is, and this is pretty consistent in all these small studies, that it's after abiraterone, enzalutamide uh, has about half the response rate. So it used to be uh, uh, like 40-50% uh, in the firm study and it gets back to 20-30% depending a little bit how you define PSA response, mm -hmm. if you define it as a 50% uh, decrease then it's between 20 and 30% and that's about half what you would expect. Yeah, and to be fair, it works the other way too, doesn't it? So abiraterone is less active if you've had enzalutamide before. <laughs> Probably yes, although we, we don't have much data on this yet. Um, so that would be the question, of course, for, for the future also. Um, is there a difference if you start with one and then give the other or not? But obviously there is some cross-resistance. That's what we can say today. Yeah, this is um, very topical in the UK um, because enzalutamide is only approved for use in patients who've not had previous abiraterone in the UK. Um, okay. So what is, is that a number, I mean, is that a substantial number of patients who do not get abiraterone first line? Uh, no, pretty much everybody gets yeah, abiraterone yeah. first line. So they're not getting access to so enzalutamide. enzalutamide in fact. All right. So what happens in your practice with these drugs? How do you use the two of them? Well, currently we're, we're also uh, saying, well, everybody where there's no real contraindication, then I don't see much around. Uh, gets abiraterone in first line CRPC. Even, you know, there's been some discussions if it has bad Gleason score, um, the effect might be lesser. There's some paper here that's been presented by, I think it was Karim Fizazi, showing that no matter if Gleason is 8 or higher or 8 and lower, for 302 Cougar 301, there's no difference in the effect of abiraterone compared with placebo. So that's probably not a reality, that's just a myth. The view of some investigators say don't give them abiraterone when they have liver metastasis. Also, here we don't have exact data on that, that these patients do better on chemotherapy. So yeah, we give pretty much everybody abiraterone. And so right now, um, in your practice, where does enzalutamide fit in? Well, if these patients, uh, I mean, 
after some time they do progress. And then of course you could discuss intuitively would like to give them enthalutamide directly after abiraterone. Some people use it off-label, can't tell that, but it, it's done. And some people give docetax cell in between and then give enthalutamide, uh, despite the fact we just discussed that it's not as effective. But there are still some responses. Yes. So things could change now with the results of the PREVAIL right. trial. So would you care to make a prediction, um, let's say a year or two's time, um, then how are you going to be using abiraterone and enzalutamide? Well, in general, if you look at the data that have been presented here yesterday, it would seem to me that uh, people will uh, rather give enzalutamide in first line than abiraterone in first line. Why is that? There's been some advantages like, yes, they have a significant uh, survival uh, adva OS advantage uh, over placebo. Response rates look a little better. You don't need no prednisone, prednisolone, whatever you have to give as co-medication. Side effects are unproblematic. So there's a number of small advantages. That, and also, uh, one argument might be urologists are used to that kind of drugs because they have been given b for decades. And it, it does not only sound similar, it mm. works similar. So that might be another argument that I would predict that it's going to end up in first line. Yes, could have quite a big impact actually, couldn't it? So we oncologists could be twiddling our thumbs because you'll be looking <laughs> after all the patients. Well, I'm not sure there, I mean, probably uh, even, yeah, if urologists go into that game by giving the patients enzalutamide, there will be still a significant number reaching progression and reaching second, third, fourth line treatment. So you will not be out of business, okay. don't worry about it. Thank you. So one last question yeah. for you. Uh, we've been talking about the novel hormonal treatments. Yeah. What about radium-223? Where's that going to fit in with everything else? Yeah, that's <laughs> very interesting. Uh, radium has just been approved in Europe and people still try to figure out where it fits in. So, um, and the approval is independent of dose attack cell. So I would think that it's gonna be a little earlier in the course of the disease than suggested by the El Simca study. So it would be probably given after first line hormonal treatment, which is currently abiraterone. And then people have to think, is that a candidate for RAD223? And if it's a patients with bone metastasis only? Yes, could be. So it could well be that for, the, for this year, it's, it's somewhere in second line for MCRPC. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Kurt. Pleasure.